Hello, Booktube. Well, it's that melancholy moment of the week. It's the last mail haul. Tomorrow, Sunday, there's no mail delivery, so I have to go the whole day without getting any free books in the mail. You just don't know what that's like. It's impossible, but I'll cope somehow. <laughs> uh, and as compensation, although this mail haul is not very big, it's just a eight or ten packages, It's uh, I'm getting Spidey Sense tings off some of them, so there might be some good stuff in here, and it ends with a box. Uh, so we'll give, we'll give this a try and see if it's enough to tide me over for the whole day where I don't get mail. <laughs> so what is this first one? Oh. Oh my. Okay. Uh, all right. I know this author's work. This comes out in June. Uh, this is uh, by John Suchet, and it is Tchaikovsky, The Man Revealed. And the reason I know his work is because he does these Man Revealed books on a number of different composers. Uh, he did one on Verity uh, that has a blurb here on the pub sheet from the Christian Science Monitor. But not me. Mm. Uh, but let's see here. So, uh, Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky was one of the most successful composers that Russia ever produced. But his path to success was not an easy one. So there you go. It's going to be the, the standard uh, Tchaikovsky biography in very short form. This is not an abridgment. This is the whole thing. Uh, and it comes out in early June from Pegasus. Tchaikovsky has had huge biographies that went into enormous amounts of detail about his environment, his finances, his family, his, uh, so and also his music. I, I don't know how much of that this will do. If memory serves, uh, the Verdi book was a pretty good trot of Verdi's life, but left out most of his surrounding age and almost all intelligent consideration of his music. I don't know. I don't... I mean, so if this book does the same thing, if I'm remembering that correctly and this book does the same thing, it will be uh, just what it promises to be. It will be a biography of Tchaikovsky, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I like my biographies to be big and atmospheric. If you've got a, a towering figure like Tchaikovsky who led a fascinating life and who and also a an extremely well-documented life, then I want to see you go for 500, 600, 700, 800 pages. Uh, and I have to feel, even when I have been proven wrong, I have on occasion been proven wrong on this subject, it all depends on the writer. But I have to feel that he deserves a longer book than this. Uh, so we will see. I will read it and see uh, how satisfying. Now this one, this next one is thin and also light. So it, it's probably also going to be a bit on the banter side. Uh, let's see here. Okay, this is a memoir. Uh, is, it, is it translated? It's going to be a paperback original for $16. It is translated from the French by Adriana Hunter. It's by Hervé Letelier. And it is all happy families. Uh, and we will, let's, what have we got here? A celebrated author always knew that he, in his own words, was, quote, a monster. He experienced a seemingly normal French childhood with parents that cared for him and did not consider him to have been an unhappy child. He was not deprived or beaten or abused, and yet he never felt the significance of the familial bonds that tied the people he, who bore him together. Unable to feel warmth, affection, and trust, he didn't cry or become filled with grief when the family died, when family died or fell terminally ill, and with his mother's detrimental interpretation of a parent-child relationship, he became numb to love. Okay, sounds like he was numb to love before then. Uh, it sounds, in fact, like he was born a psychopath. Uh, now, with time passed and perspective gained, the author is also able to reflect on the impact of his upbringing in his newest memoir. Having reached a certain emotional distance at 60 years old, it sounds like he had emotional distance all along. If you're not worried, if you're a child and you're not bothered by the, the long protracted illness of a family member, then you are biochemically wired wrong. Um, and with his father and stepfather dead and his mother suffering from late-stage Alzheimer's, Letelier is able to open up about the story of his family. Abandoned early by his father and raised in part by his grandparents, he was profoundly affected by his relationship with his mother a troubled woman with damaging views on love. In this perceptive, deeply personal account, Tellier attempts to look back on trying times in his life without anger or regret, and even with humor. Okay, all right, but even from this pub sheet, which of course the author did not write, but probably approved, we can tell that he is certainly looking back in anger, and he's looking back in anger at his mother. <laughs> and at his father, the two of them for different crimes. And, you know, family memoirs like this, someone reaches the age of 60 and says, now I'm in the position to tell my, the story of my childhood, they are invariably duplicitous, and I don't know why authors do them. It's a long tradition. People have been doing it since Tolstoy and long before that. But I don't get it. 
is the reader supposed to believe a word of this? I, I, I'm, <laughs> anyway, this comes out in late March, so I have to grapple with it. I will grapple with it right away. And of course, translated from the French or no, nothing excuses this cover design. The, it's, it's like a mockery of a bad U.S. cover design where the, the, typical, the stereotypical cheap image is a child tracing their own hand, and that's what we have here. And also, uh, might I call for a complete permanent moratorium on any illusion or alteration or uh, anything, any reference whatsoever to the first line of Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. Not Tolstoy was wrong, not some happy families, not all happy families, nothing, nothing like that. I want, I want writers in, their ti in the titles of their books to never again refer to the first line of Anna Karenina. <laughs> Uh, but, but anyway, a French memoir. Uh, it's not exactly my line of street, so we'll let, let's move on. Let's move on to this next one. Not as yet seeing what is causing the spidey sense to tingle. I'm not sure if maybe that's false. <laughs> the bean and I just went on an enormously long walk, so my spidey sense could be just uh, hyperactive. This isn't the first day. This afternoon is the first day in uh, approximately 20 years that the temperature has gone anywhere close has risen anywhere close to freezing Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, here in Boston. Today, when you go outside, fully garbed for winter, hat, gloves, co coat, scarf, you know, long underwear, whatnot, you are not actively emergency painful standing outside. It's still cold. It's still much colder than it should be. <laughs> but it's, but it's, it's not an emergency when you're outside today, for the first time in 120 years. So we indulged. <laughs> that might be it. Uh, okay, all right. Okay, this is a finished copy of another March book. Uh, a thriller, I believe. I think we might have seen the advanced copy of this. This is by S.A. Lelchuk, and it is Save Me From Dangerous Men. Uh, by day, Nikki Griffin runs a bookstore on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley. Customers love her for her book recommendations, which are far better than anything generated by an algorithm, uh, and for her famous book club, which is just as much about catching up with friends as about discussing novels. By night, Nikki Griffin gets even. As a private investigator, she takes on run-of-the-mill clients who want to know if their husbands are cheating or if their star employee is committing corporate espionage, but she also helps out the women in her book club in a way that no one else can. She finds the men who have laid hands on them and teaches, it what, teaches them what it feels like to be hurt and helpless, so she can be sure that they never do it again. When a man walks into Nikki's store asking her to follow one of his employees, it seems like a routine job. But while she's tailing the young woman suspected of stealing the company's secrets, Nikki sees a group of men threatening her, and she can't help but intervene. Suddenly, she's no longer just solving a case, she's trying to stay alive. Because there are men after her, dangerous men, Nikki's convinced that she's the perfect person to right this wrong or die trying. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I have an advanced copy of this, and I don't think I've got to it yet. Uh, the the pub sheet leads me to believe that two things will irritate me about it right out of the starting gate. We'll just hope that the author doesn't do either one of those things. Typically, when we see in novels a character who is called a great book recommender, like, for instance, the, the Little Bookshop on the Seine or the Little Red Bookshop, uh... What they are is the worst kind of bookstore person. The worst kind. I've worked with these people who think that literature works in stages. It is one program. It's one program only. It has stages like in a catechism or the Stations of the Cross. And they are the people who know those stages. And whether or not they decide ever to tell you what those stages are will be entirely up to them. But religion, uh, it, it, books, book recommendation is a religion to them. You're ready for a little Neruda, but you're not ready for Mary Oliver you're ready for a little of this author, and then in a little while, because these are laid out stages and every reader is the same, you will then be ready for that author. Every time I encounter a character like that, I want to hurl the book across the room. <laughs> I couldn't do that for 15 years because I had an enormously fat basset hound pinning me to the bed, and I can't do it now because if I hurled a book across the room, my, my schnauzer would be on it in a heartbeat and tear it to shreds, and I might need it. Uh, that That's not book recommendation. I cannot stand bookstore clerks who treat reading and books like a religion, with themselves installed, conveniently enough, as priests and priestesses. That drives me nuts. I hate it. It's so snobby. It is snobbishness codified into a religion. Uh, it, <laughs> if you ever encounter that 
in a bookstore, if you ever make the mistake to go into a retail bookstore and say, is there anyone here who can make book recommendations? And you get someone like that who's saying, well, you don't want this kind of book. You want that kind of book. And you're not ready for this kind of book yet. I think what you really need now is just say, excuse me, I'm just going to cut you off right there and leave. <laughs> Especially since now you have an alternative. <laughs> right here you have an alternative now you do not need to be in boston go to a crappy indie bookstore and get snobbed at and then make your way to my information desk at whatever big bookstore i'm working at and get the remedy to that you don't need to do that i'm right here all the time so you just come to me rather than deal with such a person because books are not a religion and recommending them does not is it's individual to you it is not part of some sort of computer algorithm that you just don't know and the second thing, <laughs> I haven't even read the book yet, could be really good. Uh, the second thing that bothers me just about the premise that I've heard from this book is that I think it's fairly obvious that by the halfway point of the novel, we, meaning the reader, are going to be strenuously encouraged to think that all men are dangerous men, that all men are evil, that when it saved me from dangerous men means just let me hang out with my, the girls in my book club. And that also is annoying. <laughs> so, so we shall see. Uh, we shall see if uh, if our heroine here gets to gets to the point where she is punching out the bad guys or even confronting them later in the book. And the message is, yeah, this is a really bad person. Fine. If she gets to that point in the book and the message is, well, this is a man who just happened to have the opportunities, and you, the male reader would easily have done all of these depraved things, too, if you had the opportunities. So you should feel really terrible while you're handing me my twenty seven ninety nine. <laughs> so we'll have to hope that the author doesn't do either one of those things. The, the, the uh, author, we're told, holds a master's degree from Dartmouth College and lives in Berkeley, California. That is the single one-line author biography that very importantly does not give gender. So <laughs> we, we shall see. <laughs> we shall see. Uh, let's move on. Certainly nothing spider sense worthy yet. But my spider sense is almost never completely wrong. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, great. Okay. Oh, fantastic. That's a finished copy. Oh, it's lovely, too. Great. Uh, all right, this is this is due any day now. I will. I, I'm going to write this up. I'm going to write a review of this. This is by Naoko Abe, and it is the Sakura obsession. Sakura is uh, cherry blossoms. Uh, the incredible story of the plant hunter who saved Japan's cherry blossoms. Uh, and this is this is uh, his story. The story of a man who. Uh, well, let's see here. Uh, it's the story of a remarkable 1,200 year history of the Japanese cherry blossom tree and the fascinating story of how it was saved from extinction by English gardener Collingwood Cherry Ingram. He didn't get the name Cherry until he started obsessing about cherries. <laughs> but, uh, Ingram first fell in love with the Sakura, the cherry tree, when he visited Japan on his honeymoon in 1907. He was so taken with the plant, he brought back hundreds of cuttings with him to England, where he created a garden of cherry varieties. In 1926, upon learning that the great white cherry had become extinct in Japan, he began a lifelong crusade to save the tree, in the years that followed, Ingram sent more than a, th a hundred varieties of cherry tree to new homes around the globe, from Auckland to Washington. Uh, and this is his story. The author, if I remember correctly, this has an, an amazing origin story, the book. Uh, the author is a Japanese journalist and nonfiction writer. She was the first female political writer to cover the Japanese Prime Minister's office, the Foreign Ministry, and the Defense Ministry uh, for one of Japan's largest newspapers. And since moving to London with her British husband and their two sons in 2001, she has worked as a freelance writer and has published five books in Japanese. Her biography of Collingwood Ingram is, in Japan won the prestigious Nihon Essayist Club Award in 2016, and she has now rewritten the book with new material for an English-language readers. So this is not a translation. She rewrote it and, and added to it and changed it around a little. So this is a new, this is a different edition than the one that, that Japanese re readers bought in droves. And uh, I can't wait. I've, I've, uh, I've already read it. I'll read it again now in the finished copy. I thought it was utterly good, just utterly charming. The, way, the sympathy that she has for Collingwood Ingram is, of course, the backbone of the book. And the, the way that she tells his story, how he is one of those rare individuals who actually changed obsessions. <laughs> he, was, he was originally obsessed with birds, with ornithology. And then at one point he just decided, objectively, there are too many people obsessed with birds. So he looked around 
for something else to be obsessed with <laughs> and, and landed on cherry blossoms, on cherry trees and their various varieties. Uh, and, of course, uh, I know quite a bit about the subject from an American standpoint because it was President Taft who brought the famous cherry trees of Washington, D.C. to their location. He, he and his wife were deeply involved in trying to get a successful shipment of healthy cherry trees to to America <laughs> so that they could grace our capital. The, some arrived dead, some were lost at sea. Uh, the story of how some of these blossoms got to America involves potatoes <laughs> in a way you might not expect. <laughs> it's a fantastic story, and I... Uh, I uh, I'm looking forward to writing about this, so I'm glad to have... This is a very pretty... The, the finished copy is pretty. It has a... You would or, I, ordinarily, I would rail against it, right? Because it's a it's a, a faded sepia tone cover, which I, I always urge books over, book publishers, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Your cover... Yes, I know you're trying to shorthand signal this is a work of history, but don't do it. That That is just a boring cover. But in this case, it's inset as a photo against a color backdrop. It's not inset quite enough. It should be a little bit smaller so that you can see more of the border. Uh, but that is still at least an, art, an attempt at, art, at artsing up <laughs> as a faded sapia tone cover. All right, so the Sakura obsession is here in the uh, finished copy. So what have we got next? Oh, are you getting your second win, little bean? You want to destroy something? <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, my. Oh, okay. This comes out in July. Wow. Okay, Steve has to eat a little humble crow here. <laughs> this is a book I predicted firmly we would never see. This is Carl Marlantes, and this is Deep River, a gigantic novel from the author of Matterhorn, the great enormous Vietnam novel Matterhorn, which was the darling of the critical press when it came out, what, 15, 20 years ago? It was the darling of the book reading world. It was the darling of book clubs everywhere. And I read it. I thought it was tremendously good. And it struck me so deeply as a one-off thing that I had no hesitation to shoot off my mouth to that, to that effect to anybody who would listen to me, saying, yeah, we'll never see another book from the author. Now, this is a very long time, but still, here it is. Wow. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, he made his name with the critically acclaimed New York Times bestseller in power, uh, uh, Matterhorn. And now he applies the same epic sweep of narrative to uh, a family saga about Finnish immigrants in the Pacific Northwest. Felling trees, then, obviously, as per the cover. So this is Barkskins. This is Annie Poole's Barkskins. Uh, he draws glancing inspiration from his own family history to tell a story against the backdrop of a logging industry clashing with the radical burgeoning labor movement, World War I, and the upheavals of early 20th century America. And the novel uh, follows three siblings who are forced to flee Finland for the United States. Wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. I didn't think we would ever see another huge epic novel from this guy, and here it is. So uh, now I'm, I'm wondering. I, I don't quite remember. This isn't, this isn't telling me, and I don't quite remember when Matterhorn came out, but it was a long time ago. Uh, and now I'm wondering uh, what kind of reception this thing is going to get. Is it going to be... Was Matterhorn sufficient to put him on the must-review radar of book editors out there? Are they going to see this and think, oh, yeah, we have to do this? Or is it just going to be another book? You know, if this were a Finnish immigrant logging novel at 600 pages by Joe Schmo, I don't think many book section editors would give it the time of day. Here it has a marquee name, but only for the one novel. I'm wondering now. I'm wondering. I'll have to, I'll have to uh, investigate and see whether or not anybody has this on their radar. Uh, I will certainly read it. I'll certainly review it. Good Lord. Uh, but still, I, I automatically wonder these things about just the professional end of this. Uh, so let's let's uh, move, let's move on here. Wow, new Carl Malakis. I, I promised people that wouldn't happen. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, okay. All right. This is a, a finished copy. We saw this already on this channel. This is due any day, I'll bet. This is due in March. I bet this is a March book. No, April. Okay, early April. Uh, this is a, uh, the finished copy of Isabel Hamad's uh, The Parisian. 
with a cover blurb by Zadie Smith. Uh, this is her debut, uh, and it tells the story of one man's journey from Palestine under the crumbling Ottoman rule to the salons of World War era Paris and back again uh, to his home in Nablus, where the seeds of the Palestinian independence movement have begun to take root. The result is an intimate, an intimate narrative of great historical and emotional heft, described by the author as, quote, in part a love story, but also a story about selfhood, dislocation, and longing, not only for people, but also for place. Interesting. Okay, well, it's a, it's a big, ambitious historical novel, a type that, now, we now have two of them here, just in this thing alone, uh, of a type that is going to just flood the bookstores in 2019. Uh, and I have not got to this, and that's that's bad because it's been sitting on my shelf. So now I will, uh, now I will get to it. And uh, that brings us to the box. That brings us to the box and the end of this mail haul. I, I confess I'm not some very interesting things here, but I'm not seeing what set off my spidey sense. Maybe maybe nothing did. <laughs> maybe maybe it was just haywire from a nice long walk. Uh, oh, that's a box bean. You don't want. <laughs> yes, you do. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, fantastic. All right, this is a March book, late in March. This is by Dion Prakash. This is the, the Finnish copy of, the, of Emergency Chronicles. Indira Gandhi and Democracy's Turning Point. This is uh, 20th century Indian history. On the night of June 20, 25, 1975, Indira Gandhi declared a state of emergency in India, suspending constitutional rights and rounding up her political opponents in midnight raids across the country. In the 21 harrowing months that followed, her regime unleashed a brutal campaign of coercion and intimidation, arresting and torturing people by the tens of thousands, raising slums, and imposing compulsory sterilization on the poor. Emergency Chronicles provides the first comprehensive account of this understudied episode in India's modern history. Uh, the author strips away the comfortable myth that the emergency, with a capital E, was an isolated event brought on solely by Gandhi's desire to cling to power, arguing that it was a much a product of India's democracy, of the Indian democracy's troubled relationship with popular politics. Mm. Wow. Okay, so who is the author? Uh, he is the Dayton Stockton Professor of History at Princeton University. And his many books... Uh, oh, God. Okay, he's written lots of books. <laughs> and he lives in Princeton, New Jersey. Wow. Okay. And this is Princeton University Press. I wonder if he teaches at Princeton. Uh, does he teach at Princeton? Oh, yes, he is. I just said that. He's a teacher at Princeton. Okay. Uh, well, this is fantastic. Okay. So this is this is coming up right away. I need to get to this. Uh, this will probably take priority over everything else we've seen today. <laughs> All right. So so that is our mail haul. That is our last mail haul of the week. A good balance between fiction and nonfiction. A good balance of historical fiction. So we have Emergency Chronicles. I believe the pub sheet is right, at least as far as my reading goes. I don't think I've ever read one soup to nuts comprehensive history of that incident, of the emergency. I, I, so I can't wait. Uh, then The Parisian, Isabella Hamad's debut, an ambitious debut. And uh, then Deep River, Carl Marlante's follow-up to Matterhorn. A very different kind of book. Fascinating to see what, what similarities there will be. Then The Sakura Obsession, about one man's obsession with cherry blossoms. Uh, Save Me from Dangerous Men, in a finished copy. Uh, All Happy Families, uh, a memoir. And Tchaikovsky, The Man Revealed, uh, a rather thin biography of Tchaikovsky. We'll see, we'll see what kind of punch it brings. Uh, and that's it. That is, that is the end of yet another week of hauling mail on this channel. So, uh, so I'll wrap this up for now, uh, but I will be back. Thank you, BookTube.